thank you, Mr. Speaker. To ask the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster if he will update the House on the mechanisms for upholding standards in public life. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure uh, to appear before you and uh, this House on uh, this important matter. And, Mr. Speaker, we are fortunate in this country to have a sophisticated and robust system for upholding public standards. And the system is multifaceted. It is made up of interlocking and complementary elements. Uh, it is, of course, founded on the seven principles of public life, which have been in place for a quarter of a century, and which provide the overarching qualities and standards of behaviour that are expected. And, Mr Speaker, um, I have some time to run through all of the mechanisms that underpin the seven principles, but um, I'll touch on something else first, and that is this. Um, and it, it is something with regard to the potential victims in any case where there are allegations of impropriety of any sort. I was a barrister in criminal practice for 17 years before being elected to this House, and I know how difficult it is um, for individuals to come forward. It is very important that we do not prejudge uh, any individual case. It is also right that the system that, after all, this House created and relatively recently, namely the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme, is allowed to work its course. Um, Mr Speaker, there are additional rules and guidance to help ensure consistency of approach. For example, in relation to public appointments, corporate governance and business appointments when individuals move to roles outside of government. And Mr Speaker, there are independent bodies that provide a broad oversight of standards. The Right Honourable Lady, the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, has asked about the mechanisms for upholding those standards, and they exist, and they exist as a result of the decisions of this House. Uh, there are bodies and there are office holders uh, with a role in overseeing specific aspects of public life, such as the Parliamentary Commissioner on Standards, the Civil Service Commission, the Commissioner for Public Appointments, and alongside these, there are regimes for the publication of government transparency data and information on those who lobby government. So we do have a parliament, Mr Speaker, as you know, that upholds standards to cover all of those in public life. But it is incumbent upon us not to prejudge these decisions. Um, ministers, public office holders, officials in all of their activities must maintain the confidentiality of those who wish to make complaints uh, across the lifetime of their involvement. But um, let me say that no system can replace the fundamental importance of personal responsibility. We all know this to be true. Codes and rules and oversight bodies are there to guide us, but we all ultimately in public life must choose for ourselves how to act. We now go to Angela Rayner. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, but this constant charade just will not wash. These latest disturbing allegations about the ministerial misconduct are all about abuse of power. And there is one common fault, Mr Speaker, with the system currently that the Minister spoke about, and that's the power that's granted by this Prime Minister. The Minister spoke about personal responsibility. Well, the Minister needs to remind the Prime Minister of his personal responsibility. Last week, the Prime Minister said that he knew nothing of specific allegations about misconduct by the member for Tamworth. Then he claimed he had only been aware of reports and speculation. But, Mr Speaker, the truth is out today, and that defence has been completely blown apart. Lord Macdonald says the Prime Minister was informed about the complaint that was upheld of inappropriate behaviour against the then Minister. Does the Minister here accept Lord Macdonald is telling the truth, or is he telling us the Prime Minister wasn't aware of it? What happened to the complaint, Mr Speaker, and why was nothing done at the time? A Minister of State at the Foreign Office 
has a deeply sensitive role in national security. Was this issue even raised or brought up in the vetting process and was the Prime Minister informed? And why was this conduct not considered a breach of the ministerial code? Why did the Prime Minister allow him to stay in post? This goes to the heart of wider issues here, Mr Speaker, and the public have had enough. Since the resignation of yet another of the Prime Minister's ethics advisers last month, there has been an even bigger ethical vacuum in Downing Street with no accountability in place. How can the Minister come here today and say that this simply just wouldn't happen again? The Prime Minister was personally informed about these allegations and yet he was either negligent or complicit. What message, Mr Speaker, does this send about the standards of this government and what they set? What message does this send to the British people facing a cost of living crisis while their government is paralysed with scandal? When will this minister stop defending the indefensible and say enough is enough? Minister Ellis. Um, Mr Speaker, the matter of what happened with regards to the member for Tamworth is now under investigation. Um, And it is possible possible that a police investigation may follow, may. So it is clear that the subjudice rule should apply to individual cases, both both because of the interests of justice to, uh, to everyone concerned, both to those accused and those who are potential victims. So the subjudice rule should apply very much to this debate. But with regards to the appointment that um, the Right Honourable Lady mentions to the Whip's office in February, appointments in government are subject, of course, to advice um, on matters of propriety, not to veto, but they are subject to advice. And in addition, the usual uh, reshuffle procedures were followed by government. Um, I asked the House to accept that, bearing in mind um, the member in question had been uh, reappointed to government by a previous Prime Minister in 2018, and then that he had been appointed in 2019 as a Foreign Office Minister, and then, crucially, that he was appointed for a third time in February, I doubt whether anyone could, in knowledge of those facts, say that this Prime Minister should have acted otherwise than he did. It is, the morally, it is the morally fair thing to do in any case, it is the morally fair thing to do in any case to assess the situation based on evidence, uh, not unsubstantiated rumour. It's incumbent on all of us in this House, as it is in society generally, to act fairly. If there is no evidence at the time, if there's no live complaint, no ongoing investigation, surely it is not unreasonable to consider making an appointment. Now, I have made some initial inquiries subject to, uh, this is subject to further assessment, but in the limited amount of time available, my my understanding is as follows. In October 2019, officials raised concerns um, with the permanent secretary uh, concerning the member in question. Uh, The Permanent Secretary commissioned work to establish facts. Uh, That was undertaken on his behalf by the Cabinet Office. Uh, This exercise reported in due course to the then Permanent Secretary, who had agreed its terms. The exercise established that while the Minister meant no harm, uh, what had occurred caused a high level of discomfort. Uh, This is what the exercise established. The Minister apologised and uh, those raising the concern accepted the resolution. The Prime Minister was made aware of this issue in late 2019. He was told that the Permanent Secretary had taken the necessary action. No issue therefore arose about remaining as a Minister. And last week, when fresh allegations arose, the Prime Minister did not immediately recall the conversation in late 2019 about this incident. As soon as he was reminded, 
as soon as he was reminded, the number 10 press office uh, corrected their public lines. So the position is quite clear. Uh, further inquiries will be made, but the position is that the Prime Minister acted with probity at all times. It is not appropriate, whether in private life or in public life, to act on unsubstantiated rumour. We now come to the Chair of the Committee, William Rank. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend mentions the sophisticated and robust systems for upholding standards in public life. But those systems are, on the whole, irrelevant if the participants have no regard for them. The question that faces the government, and I would suggest my honourable and right honourable friends sat on the front bench, and I notice a greater degree of propensity of government whips rather than other ministers at this time, is for them to consider what they are being asked to say in public, which changes seemingly by the hour, and I would ask them to consider, Mr Speaker, the common sense of decency that I know the vast, vast majority of them have, and ask themselves if they can any longer tolerate being part of a government which, for better or worse, is widely regarded as having lost its sense of direction. It is for them to consider their positions. This is not a question of systems. It is a question of political judgment, and that political judgment cannot be delegated. Mr. Well, my, right, my honourable friend is quite wrong. Um, the fact of the matter is, this is a government that knows its direction, and that is to serve the British people in dealing, in dealing with the issues that matter to them, including cost of living, the crisis in Ukraine and those other issues, including the pandemic, which this Prime Minister and this Government have dealt with in an, in a, an exemplary fashion. Yeah. Go to SNP spokesperson Brendan O'Hara. Yeah. Well, here we are again, Mr <laughs> Speaker. Once again, the, the Minister for Defending the Indefensible is sent out to defend his boss. But even he must realise the speed at which we reconvene in this place to question the veracity of the Prime Minister's version of events. It's like being on a merry-go-round, a merry-go-round which gets faster and faster. Today it's the turn of Lord Macdonald, the former senior civil servant at the FCDO, to call out the Prime Minister's claim that he was unaware of any specific allegations against the Honourable Member for Tamworth when he appointed him to Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Whip. In his letter to the Commissioner of Standards, Lord Macdonald is unequivocal and saying that three years ago, in 2019, the Prime Minister was briefed in person about the initiation and outcome of the investigation. Mr Speaker, Lord Macdonald's letter absolutely demolishes the Prime Minister's claims that he did not know and once again raises serious concerns and questions about whether he's broken the ministerial code. How much longer will we have to endure this seemingly endless merry-go-round and will the Secretary of State now commit to holding a full and transparent investigation into this matter and perhaps finally allowing us and the people of the United Kingdom to get off this appalling merry-go-round. Minister. Well, I, I realise that uh, the Honourable Gentleman from Scotland wishes to make political hay out of this situation, but it really doesn't wash. It's not indefensible to defend natural justice. Natural justice means acting on evidence, not on gossip, rumour and innuendo. Um, it, is, it is a fact that in this place, and in SW1 generally, there are rumours, gossip and innuendo about a multitude of issues and a multitude of people. The reason journalists don't report that is because they can't stand it up with evidence. The reason why uh, others do not act is, is, in many cases, because they have not got evidence. And it is not indefensible to defend the principles of natural justice and not expect people to act to defenestrate individuals without proof. And that is the difference. Sir Bernard Jones. Mr Speaker, there is periodically much discussion in this place and about this place 
about how we should address uh, the culture of this place that seems to give permission for the wrong attitudes and the wrong behaviours. Um, but how does it help if our own political leaders in all political parties finish up promoting people with the wrong attitudes and the wrong behaviours? Isn't that exactly what gives permission for the wrong attitudes and the wrong behaviours to persist? Yeah. 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 Well, my right honourable friend would be right if he were... Um, working under the assumption that those making the appointment knew that the individual in question um, was, uh, had the wrong behaviours and the wrong attitudes. Submitting that it is a possibility is not sufficient. Uh, there are rumours uh, would not be sufficient, and there is the crux of the difference. Chris Bryant, Thomas. I hope one day that the Minister plays these things back to himself and listens to himself. I don't think he'll be proud of himself in later days. And I know many Conservative, decent Conservative MPs feel terribly ashamed by everything that has happened in this sordid process. But isn't the real problem here that if the boss is somebody who has spent all their political career trying to get away with things yeah. Yeah. and finding themselves innocent in the court of their own opinion. Yeah. Mm. If their boss is somebody who boasts to everybody laughingly that all the sex pests support him for the leadership. Yeah. If the boss is somebody who, whenever he gets into trouble, tries to destroy the system. Yeah. The truth is that all his allies will endlessly take liberties. Mm. And it doesn't feel like then a government that is trying to serve the British people. Mm. It just feels like a government that is trying to help itself. Yeah. 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 Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman takes a sanctimonious tone. <laughs> he, wishes to, he wishes to set himself up. When it comes to this government, of course, he wishes to set himself up as judge, jury and executioner. But the reality of the matter is that uh, Taking the moral high ground is not something that I think uh, fits well. Uh, what uh, he should bear in mind is that it is also moral to treat people fairly. Uh, and that includes victims and that includes the accused. And that is what uh, I have done and what I seek to do. John Penrose. Oh. Mr Speaker, the Minister rightly pointed out in his introductory remarks that the seven principles, the seven Nolan principles of integrity in public life run underpin all the way through the uh, ministerial code. But it is clear from Lord Macdonald's letter today that number 10 have not been honest in what they have said. That is what Lord Macdonald says in terms. One of the seven Nolan principles is honesty. <coughs> number 10 was previously accused without rebuttal of lacking leadership by Sue Gray in her report over what went on over Partygate. How many more of the seven principles are they going to have to breach before the honourable, my honourable friend will stand up and say, enough is enough? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. I, I don't accept the premise of his question. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, and I think he, he will note, that after the uh, exercise, the investigation that I referred to a few moments ago, when the appointment was made, um, I'm not aware of, to, to, of the minister in question, the former minister in question, to the Department for Levelling Up, uh, I'm, and then to the Whip's office. I'm not aware that any further objection was made from the senior civil servant in question. Uh, and so I think uh, that is something from which he can draw uh, a note. Wendy Chamberlain. As many in this House know, uh, I served as a former police officer, but something that is important for us as MPs, every single one of us, is our responsibilities for safeguarding, both here within this estate and out in our constituencies. Yeah, yeah. And if I received an unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated allegation, I'd be doing my best to find out as much as I could about it, not just from a curiosity perspective, but to ensure that people are safe. Yeah. What has failed here is it a failure of process, integrity, or both? Minister. Uh, no, as I've articulated, there was an exercise within the Foreign and Commonwealth Office about the matter, which I believe went on for several weeks. Um, I need to confirm the details because I've had insufficient time this morning. But as I uh, said a few moments ago, there was an exercise, and the exercise concluded to the satisfaction of all involved. 
That is within the department, and that's, it, it, it appears to me to be before the Prime Minister was made aware. Peter Byrne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I remember recently there was a Brexit opportunities debate here. There were no Liberal Democrats. There were virtually no Labour members. The only time they turn up here is to bash Boris. And it seems to me, well, can I just ask, can I ask, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the Honourable Member, right honourable friend of mine, in Northamptonshire, which we share, do you think our constituents are more concerned about an MP they've never heard about or the biggest tax reduction in decades, which is going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> He hits the nail on the head, as usual, Mr Speaker. The fact of the matter is, as my friend from Wellingborough points out, the party opposite have made frequent uh, requests for business in this House to be separated over from what our constituents care about, primarily, to personalities. Personalities, because when it comes to policies, Mr Speaker, uh, they don't raise the issues, because when they do, they lose. Instead, they focus on personalities, and that's been the drive of the past six months. Ben Bradshaw. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Given the character and record of this Prime Minister and of this Number 10, and the fact that numerous ministers in recent days have been sent out yeah. to spout different version of events, <laughs> which as the BBC political editor this morning described as all having become drivel, how can any of us, including he himself, have confidence that the latest version of events that he's given to the House today is true? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Minister. in the first place, I, the, what I have said to the House is a principle of natural justice, which is true in every case and would be true with their allegations against anyone in any circumstances, and which is fair then to complainants uh, and those subject to those allegations alike. That applies all the time. And so it isn't a question of uh, the individual facts that he's alluding to. It is an overarching principle of fairness in life, which is to act on evidence rather than gossip, innuendo and rumour. It may be that that gossip, innuendo and rumour later turns out to be true. But when persons in authority have to make decisions, they should do so properly and for good reason. Jackie Doyle Price. Mr. Speaker, I've listened to our old friend uh, very carefully, and I, and I hear what he says about natural justice, but the truth of the matter is that the, the Government Whip's office is meant to be the office that organises getting the Government's business done. That involves providing a safe space for discussions about policy issues where there are differences, and safe space for welfare. Now, what this, notwithstanding what he said about natural justice, the very whiff of rumours and historic incidents that Sam McDonald's referred to in his letter today should have been enough to tell the Prime Minister that that appointment was unwise and he could have made use of the Honourable Gentleman's talents in a different department, as he had done previously. But that aside, you know, we are in a real problem here that we've had a succession of, I think we're now on a half a dozen different variations of degrees of honesty with which the knowledge of these events has been addressed by Number 10. Can I just say to my honourable friend, I'm, I'm very fond of him. I think he has a really sticky wicket to do today. But really, the way we move on from this is having a complete reset of standards, a complete reboot of the ministerial code, and could I ask him what he intends to do to really convey to this House that the provisions of the ministerial code are taken seriously by this government? Yeah. Minister. Well, I can assure uh, my friend, that the, the, the codes of conduct, the codes of practice are adhered to firmly by this government and supported by this Prime Minister. She will know that any Prime Minister, in fact uh, any Secretary of State, Cabinet Minister, uh, any Minister of the Crown will regularly be dealing with a vast quantity of information. Uh, it is not a question of honesty or dishonesty. It is a question of recalling every fact years after the event. Um, and if the circumstances were such that were not um, uh, you know, firmly uh, crystallised in, in uh, any individual's mind at the time that they were being given that information, it, they can easily uh, not be recollected. Uh, it doesn't necessarily immediately impugn dishonesty if someone doesn't recall something years after the event. And so I, I, would, I would ask 
uh, my honourable friend to bear that very much in mind. Mr Speaker, the Minister has danced on a pinhead here, but as the Honourable Lady, the Member for Fife says, we are not just MPs, Ministers, Whips. We also employ staff in this place, staff who are often alone in our offices with us, who rely on a code and a proper workplace. We do not have this here, and this just undermines the support that we should be providing to the many people who work here. We've got to get away from this idea of MP exceptionalism and stop dancing on a pinhead. The Minister should heed the words of the Honourable Member for Hazel Grove and say enough is enough. Minister. Well, I agree with the Honourable Lady in as much as she says that we need to have care for our employees here. And that is very much something with which we would all agree. And in fact, we do have, uh, and it is this government that set up the independent complaints and grievance system for staffers from this place. To, uh, to do that. And so, and so I would ask her to characterise it as something in which we are all on the same side, and I would urge anyone who has any complaints at any time to make those complaints known. That is how justice is done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr Caroline Johnson. Mr Speaker. Mr. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend says all are innocent until proven guilty and makes a point, which I agree with, that unsubstantiated allegations should not lead to people losing their jobs or not being appointed. What he said is that the Prime Minister knew of the allegation in 2019. He said that discomfort was caused and he said that the mem right honourable member for Tamworth apologised. The letter from Lord Macdonald says, and I quote, in substance the allegations at that time were similar to those Macdonald made about so similar to those made about bad behaviour at the Carlton Club. The allegations as reported from the time at the Carlton Club include sexual assault. Can he confirm if the allegations made back in 2019 were of sexual assault? And if they were and they were upheld and apologised, why the police weren't involved, why he wasn't sacked at the time, never mind given another job. Minister. I, I'm unable to speak to that, but what I would say is this. We must do everything we can to protect the, uh, the confidentiality of those who make complaints. And I'm very concerned that the way in which this matter um, ha has been processed uh, by some individuals means that it, it opens up a risk of a breach of confidentiality um, for those who uh, have made complaints. That is absolutely paramount. The boy who stands on the burning deck, and his problem is, is that the Prime Minister is going to desert him as well. The trouble is that gossip and innuendo actually become facts, and that's something the Minister doesn't recognise. Minister after Minister has been humiliated going out, given a storyline that's been given to them by number 10, which then subsequently changes. And the story has changed again today from the minister's own yeah. mouth. Yeah. And we've seen the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, we've seen the, the Honourable Member for Colchester, and now uh, we've got the facts from Lord Macdonald. And the fact is that special advisers have been used to put out and peddle this misinformation so what is going to be done to investigate them under the Special Advisors Code of Conduct? Yeah. Because we can't keep having number 10 just peddling lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, disagree with it, uh, I disagree with the Honourable Gentleman. There's absolutely no evidence of what, of what he speaks. The reality of the matter is that when uh, years old allegations resurface, inquiries have to be made uh, and it's not an immediate exercise. Those have to be got right and every effort is being made to give accurate information. I've said in my opening remarks to this Honourable House that uh, in the limited amount of time I have had available, that is the information that I have received, but clearly uh, there will be an exercise to be done. Oh, well, um, last week, my colleague, the Right Honourable Member for Dwyver Merionydd, tabled a bill which would make it an offence for politicians who willfully mislead the public. Yeah. Will he press the Leader of the House for parliamentary time for a second reading debate <laughs> of this bill as a step towards restoring people's faith in democracy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Minister? The business of the House is not a matter for me, Mr Speaker. Dame Diana Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. 
Mr yeah. Speaker. I wondered whether the Minister was able to confirm uh, whether anyone had personally raised with him concerns about the member for Tamworth. Minister. That is not a matter for me, Mr Speaker. There are mechanisms in place, uh, and I am not responsible for appointments, but there are mechanisms in place for complaints to be made. Neil Hamby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is a few short weeks ago that uh, Lord Geit pres at Lord Geit's resignation, I asked the Minister what fresh scandal was coming down the tracks, and he assured me there was none, yet here we are. Um, and this, the principle at stake here should resonate not just in this place but in parliaments across the UK and beyond because accepting personal responsibility, lawfulness, truth-telling are essential conditions of honourable conduct. As President Nixon discovered, it was the cover-up and the decision to lie that delivered his undoing. So misconduct in public office is a serious charge. And following the recent re uh, revelations from Lord Macdonald, can the Minister tell the House what did the Prime Minister know and when did he know it? I have already dealt with that matter, but I will say this. I don't think any uh, member of this House from any of the political parties opposite should take a moral high ground in this matter. Uh, I, I, do not, I do not choose to, go to, to reiterate why. But none of us uh, should come to this House expecting all of the criticism for any misconduct by any member to be levelled against any one individual. Um, what happens is that when, when wrongdoing has been found to be done, that it is properly dealt with in the interests of justice, whatever political party it was, but the Honourable Members opposite wish to make party political points out of a serious matter. Maria Regal. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Downing Street and the Prime Minister's official spokesman over the last few days have said in different, at different times different things, that the PM wasn't aware of any allegations against the former uh, government deputy chief whip. That was the first thing. Then they said they weren't aware of any specific allegations. Then they said they weren't aware of any serious specific allegations. <laughs> then they said they weren't aware of any allegations that were substantiated. Yet the letter from Lord Macdonald to the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards published today shows that all of those briefings appear to be untrue. So, can the Minister tell the House whether the Cabinet Secretary is investigating these serial breaches of the Special Advisor's Code of Conduct? Minister. No, Mr Speaker, I don't accept her characterisation. What she, what she obviously doesn't wish to recognise is that uh, as days pass during a heated uh, episode of investigation and media inquiries, uh, pictures become more crystallised. And as I said in my opening remarks, when fresh allegations arose, the Prime Minister didn't immediately recall uh, the matter that had been raised with him in late 2019. As soon as he was reminded, number 10 press office corrected the public line. So uh, it, it is not a matter of anything other than uh, recollection and due process. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Just two months ago, the Prime Minister stood at the dispatch box and told me at Prime Minister's questions, I quote, that of course sexual harassment is grounds for dismissal. Yet in 2019, he kept the Honourable Member for Tamworth as Minister, and this year, gave him powers over MPs' welfare as Deputy Chief Whip, despite knowing a formal complaint had been upheld against him. Let's be very clear, Lord Macdonald's letter is in black and white, saying Mr Johnson was briefed in person about the outcome of that investigation. This isn't about rumour or innuendo or gossip. So doesn't this show that the mechanisms for upholding standards in public life are only as good as the independence and the integrity of the person charged with enforcing them. Yeah, yeah. And doesn't that show that we need not just radical systems reform, but that the Prime Minister himself just has to go? Yeah, 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 yeah. What, um, Minister. what the Honourable Lady wishes to do is to draw politics into this matter. And I would respectfully suggest to her that her drive to remove the Prime Minister will fail. And the reason it will fail is because she focuses on personalities rather than on politics and policies. And 
if she wishes to change the Prime Minister, she needs to win a general election in order to do so. This mechanism, this mechanism is not uh, suitable for the party politics that she wishes to play. Jessica Lips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if the Minister's seen his own government's enough campaign about abuse and harassment, which literally has a, an image of a drunk in a pub groping someone, and the line is that this is enough and that people should step in and do what they can. It doesn't say, wait till a completely independent inquiry has gone on whilst you're in the pub with a gropey man uh, and, until you can try and do anything about it. What the Minister has stood in here today and done is sought to use bodies for standards in this House that he was not in the meetings for, I was, that were set up to protect people, to look after victims, whether it's the Sue Grave report, whether it's the ICGS, there's always something that is meant to be for the standards for the public that a minister stands there and leans on to try and get out of basically telling untruths to the public allowing sycophancy rather than morality to be the reason why people are given their jobs. My final question to the Minister is, if it had been me giving out those jobs, does he think the MP for Tamworth would have been able to get one? Yeah. 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 I would expect the Honourable Lady perhaps more than she would expect of me, and by that I mean that I would expect her to act fairly. Uh, so I hope that answers her question. If she was in that position of responsibility to make decisions about appointments, I would expect her to act fairly. Full stop. Lord Russell Boyle. The problem that we have, it seems, is many processes, all of which lead to back to the personal discretion of the Prime Minister. Is it not the case that we need a single unified process of which there is not the engagement of the Prime Minister or internal party documentations or machinations where light is shone on this, which protects the victims, protects the accusers and not protects the abusers. Absolutely. Is it not the case that we need that now away from the Prime Minister Absolutely. and independent of this place and himself? Here, here. Minister. Well, I've already adumbrated that there was an exercise within the Foreign Office at the time. So, so the reality of the matter is there was a process that was undertaken. Mr. Carr. Speaker, uh, in response to Sue Gray's interim report, the Prime Minister announced that he would set up an office of the Prime Minister to address what she had identified as fragmented and uh, complicated leadership structures, which in turn led to blurring of lines of accountability. Given the variety of conflicting accounts that we have heard in the last few days, how does the Minister think that's worked out? <laughs> Minister. Well, if he's asking me about machinery of government processes and changes, that's not within my area of responsibility. But um, he knows what uh, has been said about that, and the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, there is work going on all the time to look at machinery of government, and no doubt that will continue. Sarah Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, we now seem to be in a position where Number 10 have just admitted that the Prime Minister was told um, about the upheld complaint, but he forgot. Um, has the Minister ever found himself in the position where he did not immediately recall being told of an upheld complaint of sexual harassment by a fellow Minister? I would ask her to understand that a Prime Minister has a myriad array of urgent and pressing responsibilities. He may be told literally hundreds of things in any one day. And the reality of the matter is I cannot obviously speak exactly to somebody else's uh, mind, whoever that person may be. But um, if she says to the House that she has never uh, forgotten anything, uh, or have I ever forgotten anything, or misremembered something, then I don't accept that. Lord Pollard. As somebody Thank who's had all of these complaints, well, I didn't forget them. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There's a real concern amongst staff, members of Parliament here, about a culture within Westminster that protects abusers, mm. that doesn't encourage victims to come forwards. Yep. What we are seeing here is potentially the start of an unlocking 
of a type of abuse which has been common in Westminster for far too long, of men abusing other men, yep. particularly young men. Yeah. Yeah. That is a scandal which will run for miles and miles because yeah. it has been overlooked, it's been deliberately hidden, yeah. and those behind it have in some cases had the very highest people protect them yeah. through forgetting that things have happened. Mm. Will the minister give us assurance now that he will treat a sexual abuse attack on a man in the same way as it would be on a woman and make very clear that there should not be a single member of parliament in this place, in any party, that is guilty of that? Well, minister, he's completely wrong. He's completely wrong. There is no such culture either in this legislature or in the executive. And the fact of the matter is, I have already said from this dispatch box that any victim should come forward of any incident at any time uh, and make themselves known and make their complaints. Uh, all are treated equally and will be treated equally. And I have prosecuted personally cases in court. Uh, so he asks me about that, but I am actually one of those individuals, and there are a few barristers in this House who have been in criminal practice, who has prosecuted individuals for sexual assault and other criminal offences. So I'm very alive to the issues, generally, and I ask him to accept that we come to this House, all of us, in good faith to do the best we can for A, our constituents, and B, to look after those who work for us as best we can. And where there are failings, it is incumbent upon us to do the best we can to remedy and rectify those failings. That doesn't mean that we have to expect perfection in all cases, but it means that we should act fairly and reasonably at all times and do the very best we can. John Moore. I'll, I'll, if, if, if he's looking at criminal matter. The cost of living crisis made worse by underfunded, slashed public services. Does the Minister agree with me that in the interests of the most efficient use of public funds and of public service time, it would be best to open one commission to identify and investigate the occasions on which the Prime Minister has actually told the truth? Minister. She mentions her constituents and mine and the focus on cost of living, but I'm afraid the Labour Party have dealt with, have, have requested and been granted numerous uh, hours in this House, which I have had the honour to respond to from this dispatch box, they haven't asked about cost of living. They haven't debated cost of living. They've debated, uh, they've debated personalities. And I ask her to bear in mind, if she's asking about the time of this House, to bear in mind what her party has been focusing on. And it isn't the global cost of living crisis. Wayne David. <coughs> the events of the, the past week show that the Prime Minister is sadly lacking ethics. Will the Minister confirm that it's still the intention of a Prime Minister not to appoint an independent ethics advisor? Mm. Minister. Well, I, I have no idea what the Honourable Gentleman is referring to. I don't recall at any point anyone saying that would be the case, so I can't confirm something that I don't know to be the case. In fact, uh, uh, on the contrary, the Prime Minister is focused on ensuring that proper mechanisms are in place to uphold all standards in public life. Catherine West. Mr Speaker, I'd like to give the Minister another opportunity. Will there be another ethics uh, lead appointed by this government? I think we have Minister. said that arrangements will be put in place uh, in due course. Mr Speaker, quite frankly, this stinks. And the Minister does us all a disservice today because public standards in public life do matter, despite what anyone yeah. on his benches might say. People need to trust that the people who make decisions and work in organisations that work on their behalf can be trusted. And we no longer have an independent ethics advisor since he resigned. Yeah. Doesn't he, he not believe it is urgent that a new ethics advisor is found and put in place? Otherwise, how can anyone trust that this government will uphold and investigate breaches of standards effectively? Minister. Well, I've already said that the matter is being given the closest attention uh, by the Prime Minister and by Downing Street, and we do focus on standards in public life 
as we do and as I've adumbrated before in the list of matters that are available to those who seek to, uh, to make complaints and wish to make complaints. In the interim period, people can make complaints to their permanent secretary or the permanent secretary of the relevant department, and that appears to be what happened in the instant case in 2019. And this one. Thank you, Mr. Um, the Minister has stated that the Prime Minister's current defence in this matter is, I was told, but I forgot. The Minister mentioned his time in practice. If a client had produced that <laughs> defence, what advice would he have given him? And, uh, and would he have put him in the, in the witness box? <laughs> well, if anyone should go into the witness box, I think it is the front bench of the party opposite. Because if he seeks, if he seeks to challenge this party. It is this party that delivers what the people of this country want. It's this party that secured the largest majority since the 1980s at the last general election, and it's this Prime Minister that will go on to fight the next general election, because it's about policies, not personalities, and he wishes to make political points out of a serious allegation. Charlotte. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With around one in three women and one in seven men being survivors of sexual violence, many of whom will work on the parliamentary estate, mm. and whether you know it or not, be sitting in this very chamber right now, what assurances can the Paymaster General give them and survivors across the country that Parliament is a safe place to work yeah. and this government yeah. fit to govern, given the gaslighting that we've been subjected to yes. today from the dispatch box? Yeah. And when cabinet ministers, including the Justice Secretary, yeah. are happy to go on national television and obfuscate and minimise the severity of allegations of this nature as long as the alleged perpetrators are sufficiently loyal to the Prime Minister. Yeah. 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 Well, obviously, no one has from this box or anywhere else uh, done what she alleges. The fact, of the, matter, the fact of the matter is, not everyone who disagrees. Not everyone who disagrees with the Honourable Lady is being dishonest. She needs to recognise that there is a, a version of events that every individual has. She wishes to make political points and claim that there is dishonesty involved. There is a difference of, uh, there's a difference of recollections in some cases and a difference of circumstances. It doesn't mean that uh, the, per the party that disagrees with her is dishonest. Still Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the last week, we've heard the Prime Minister talking about no allegations, no specific allegations, no serious specific allegations. Clearly, the, the response was changing on an almost daily basis, and now we know that none of those uh, responses were true. Ever changing smoke and mirrors. Can I ask the Minister, why does this PM and government have such a problem with truth and honesty? Minister. Well, this government does not have the problem that he particularises. In fact, it's, if, it's the party opposite that needs to look to its own soul when it takes the sanctimonious position that it has done. I'm sorry to say that there are examples on the party opposite, and it takes the high moral tone that I don't think is fitting. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister may enjoy being pedantic in his defending the Prime Minister. However, the cover-up he is defending has resulted in reports of sexual assault. Yep. Today, we are witnessing the minister obfuscating, misusing his power. Isn't it time that withholding information when it comes to misconduct, including sexual assault, results in immediate suspension of those individuals, and that this misuse of power and safeguarding is brought into sharp focus and handed immediately over to independent investigation? Minister. Disagreeing with the Honourable Lady is not dishonest. The fact of the matter is she simply seeks to make political points, and the reality of the matter is they won't work, and they shouldn't work, because this matter is too important for that. Point of order. Point of order, Chris Brown. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, the Minister has said repeatedly today that there is an investigation ongoing. He has absolutely no means of knowing that because the ICGS process is entirely confidential and indeed it's important that it's kept confidential. Even the fact that there is an investigation is confidential. Uh, I hope that you can just confirm that, Mr Speaker, because it's so important to the victims in particular. I can concur that that is correct. 
And what I would say is it is on the record and it has been a work for others to note when we do have further debates that they do take that into account. So, sorry, Catherine West, point of order. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, once again, this point of order re re returns to the question of not getting answers. I'd be very grateful for your guidance on how we as members can uh, secure satisfactory answers. On two occasions now, I've tabled written questions relating to the Department for Health's links with Beijing Genomics Institute, following their failure to pr properly answer a question tabled by my predecessor as Shadow Asia Minister, the Honourable Member for Aberavon. My first question tabled on the 13th of January was ignored until the House rose for prorogation on the 28th of April. I subsequently tabled a follow-up on the 13, 18th of May and to date I have only received a holding response. These are vitally important questions relating to our national security and this is not good enough. Could the Speaker please advise on how the Government should answer these questions? Uh, thank you for giving me notice of the point of order. Of course I'm hoping that ministers will have heard the point. It is certainly on the record. And I would say to them, it might also consider ra raising this with the Procedure Committee, which monitors the performance of government in answering questions. And I would say quite clearly to the government, they have a duty to answer all members of parliament, whichever side of the house they come from, they should be diligent in making sure that those are answered as promptly as possible. Clive Atter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm concerned that the, the House may have been misled inadvertently, at least by omission. The, the Secretary of State just asserted that the reason that the, minister, the Prime Minister didn't, didn't, didn't recall, didn't recall uh, um, the, that he had been advised by a civil servant about uh, the, the previous issues regarding the member of Tam, for Tamworth, and that because he forgot. But my understanding is that meetings with civil servants are a matter of record and his private office would have investigated that. So my question is, how do we get redress? Because surely that, that was investigated. What was in that record and who told who about it? Well, first of all, I'm not going to continue the debate. We got through it. What I would say is you've certainly put it on the record. And knowing the honourable member, I don't think he will leave it with this question. I'm sure he will tittle out further answers as we go on. Right. Point of order. <laughs> Point of order. Um, could you give guidance to the House? The, the opposition are very cross, apparently, with the government at the moment. It appears so, anyway. Is there any reason why uh, the, the opposition can't move a vote of no confidence in the, in the government? <laughs> Can I just say, you know the answer. That's why you asked the question. What I would say, today, I don't think it was just one side. You were there and the good defence you put up, but I think you're a lone batter today. But I'm going to leave it at that. Right. I'm handing over. We now come to the uh, ten minute rule motion. Uh, Manira Wilson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to bring, a b bring in a bill to provide for a statutory definition of kinship care, to make provision about allowances and parental leave for kinship carers who take on responsibility for children whose parents are unable to care for them to make provision about education in, children to, in relation to children who are looked after by a kinship carer and for connected purposes. April, not her real name, is a constituent of mine. Her sister had bladder cancer. When she died, she left behind five children, all boys. The youngest boy was aged just five. His birth father was estranged, his stepfather left the family when his mum got the terminal cancer diagnosis. It left April's nephew traumatised and with developmental delays. Shortly before April's sister passed away, she asked April and her partner if they would look after her youngest son. Of course, they said yes. They would do anything to protect him. So before social services got involved, she and her partner welcomed in a new member of their family. But this decision came at a huge financial and personal cost. April was already contending with illness and disability in her family. She needed financial and practical support for her nephew. So she asked the council to pay for her ther his therapy. You did the right thing, the council officer said, in taking the child before you were asked to. 
This is the best place for your nephew to be, and you've saved us a, lo a lot of time and money. But this is a private family arrangement, so we have no legal duty to help you. There's nothing we can do. Had April not stepped up to look after her nephew, he would have ended up in local authority care. She has saved the taxpayer tens of thousands of pounds a year and likely ensured a more positive outlook for him. Yet because she did the right thing, she gets nothing in return for his living costs or to manage his mental ill health. April is not the only one. Every year, thousands of grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings and family friends step up to support a child whose parents are not able to care for them. And today, Madam Deputy Speaker, we've got several kinship carers in the gallery watching. They turn their lives upside down to provide children with a loving, stable home. For most of them, welcoming in a child is not a choice they make, but an instinctive reaction out of love to a dramatic, often overnight change in circumstances. This could be a death in the family or dom domestic abuse or a similar situation. The Honourable Member for Denton and Reddish, a kinship carer himself, described it to the APPG on kinship care, which he, he chairs, as the social services stalk turning up unannounced at your door one night asking you to take the child in. Kinship carers do this even though their own financial situation may be unstable. Around half of kinship carers are grandparents, relying on their hard-earned pension savings. One in three kinship carers are non-white. Yet the benefits of living with friends and relatives they already know is immense. Compared to care leavers, they're more likely to have better mental health, they're more likely to have better exam results, and they're more likely to hold down a job. It's why in Australia, kinship care is the preferred option when a child cannot be looked, at, uh, looked after at home by their birth parents. Kinship care is the Cinderella service of our children's social care system, too often ignored. The government has created a system full of unfairness and uncertainty, leaving some of the most vulnerable families without help. For carers like Kim, another constituent of mine, who has a special guardianship order, the council has a duty to assess her financial needs. But, unlike for foster carers, any financial support is means-tested, discretionary, and reviewed regularly. She told me, at the last review, we were told that we didn't qualify for an allowance, even though our costs had increased and my income had reduced due to the pandemic. I challenged this, and we now receive about half of what we used to get. It is a help, but it does not cover all the extra costs we need to find. But for others, like April, they are not legally entitled to anything. A survey published last week by the charity Kinship found that just 6%, 6%, Madam Deputy Speaker, of kinship carers with an informal arrangement receive help. Those carers who do receive allowances are paid, on average, £40 a week less than the national minimum, minimum allowance for foster carers. This is bad enough, but the government's failure to tackle the cost of living crisis is only making the situation harder. Kinship survey this, uh, this year found that 44% of kinship carers could not pay all their household bills, and over a quarter could not afford food for their families. April's partner, who was training to be a police officer, was told by the council that he should give up work. Studies show that between 30 and 40% of carers leave employment completely after taking on a child. Kinship carers do not get the same rights to employment leave as adoptive parents do. They must rely on the goodwill of their employers. This unfairness is also reflected in our education system. If a child in kinship care was previously looked after by the council, their school receives Pupil Premium Plus funding. But if a relative takes in a child to prevent them from becoming looked after in the first place, then they lose out. Their generosity in stepping up at the earliest opportunity is punished by the state. Madam Deputy Speaker, I fervently believe that every child should get the best start in life. 
and this bill I am introducing today includes four proposals to ensure that kinship carers get the financial and practical support their children need. All kinship carers should receive weekly payments equal to the national minimum weekly allowance that foster carers receive. Secondly, kinship carers should be entitled to paid employment leave when a child starts living with them, just as what happens when a family adopts a child. Thirdly, children in kinship care should have the same support as looked after children in our education system, such as Pupil Premium Plus, virtual school heads, and priority in the admissions process. Finally, these should be underpinned by a statutory definition of kinship care that will act as a gateway for carers to access the rights I've just mentioned. I'm grateful to the Family Rights Group and to Kinship for their help with this bill and their long-standing campaigns on these proposals. Voices from all sides of this House have recognised that the current situation is unsustainable. The government's own independent review of children's social care has called for change. And we on the Liberal Democrat benches will stand up for all carers in this country of all kinds. My right honourable friend, the member for Kingston and Surbiton, has spoken movingly in the past of his amazing nana and granddad who took him in after his mother passed away. We speak from the heart when we say that we want to be the voice of carers in this place. I'm glad to see the minister in his place. When I raised the issue of kinship carer allowances with him in the chamber in May, he told me that it can be advantageous to invest in that family member to avoid the child going into care. And I completely agree with him. But I know that his colleagues in the Treasury will be concerned about costs or about providing a sufficiently watertight definition of who is a kinship carer. But neither of these problems is insurmountable. On average, it costs about £72,500 a year to put a child in local authority care. If we provided every child in kinship care with a social worker and a weekly allowance, it would cost only cost the taxpayer just over half that amount. And we know that there are already systems in place in the DWP to recognise kinship carers for the benefit of the, the two-child two benefit cap. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, for most kinship carers, welcoming in a child is an unexpected, life-changing decision, but one they would make again in a heartbeat. Ian, a constituent of my honourable friend, the member for Oxford, Western Abingdon, said, having my granddaughter in the house gave us a new lease of life. It's great and we love it. But he also recognised how much harder it would be for those in much more difficult circumstances. Surely we owe it to these children who've been through so much, to these carers who've sacrificed so much and have saved the taxpayer so much to give them the financial and practical support they deserve and need to flourish. Let's step up for kinship carers and support every child to get a better start in life, no matter their background. Thank you. Yeah. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Ed Davey, Robert Halfman, Stella Creasy, Tim Lawton, Sarah Olney, Leila Moran, Mrs Emma Lewell Buck, Helen Morgan, Richard Ford and myself. Minera Wilson. 